Uh, my wife and I are happy to be here. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 1 today, so uh, I hope you have a hop- copy of the scriptures with you, and if so, you can open up the Bible uh, with me there. I'm going to read this whole passage for us, uh, and then I'm going to pray. If you have a copy of the scriptures, our ushers are right back there, and uh, you can lift your hand where you are, and they can get them to where you're standing right now. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to read, I'm going to read the whole chapter, and then I'll pray. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and a sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina and his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him, so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And she took him up with her, along with a three-year-old bull, 
an ephah of flour, a skin of wine, and she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And join with me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the scriptures, Lord, that uh, teach us of uh, true history of men and women of faith from old and also show us your eternal and unchanging character. Lord, thank you that you were the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord God, as we uh, explore through the troubles and sorrows of this woman, Hannah, may we see through them your compassion and redemption that you can demonstrate in our lives today. Open our eyes that we may behold wonderful, wonderful things out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sometimes it feels like things can't get any worse. Alone, harassed, depressed. That's where Hannah was in 1 Samuel chapter 1. When we enter into this time in the history of Israel, we're entering into a period of the worst kind of corruption that Israel had ever experienced, and that's saying something. God had a clear plan in mind to how he was going to restore his people, the whole nation of Israel, out of corruption. Eventually, it would come through out of the time of the judges, which was chaotic, and into the time of kings with the well-known David. Yet, as God had a plan for the whole nation to restore them out of corruption, 1 Samuel starts to focus on the troubles of one woman within that nation named Hannah. To no fault of her own, she was stained with the worst kind of shame that a woman in her time could have experienced, and she probably felt like it couldn't have gotten any worse. Do you know what that looks like in your own life? To be back to a corner, dug into a pit, feeling like there's absolutely no way out and it can't get any worse. God had a clear, clear plan to restore the whole nation, and he had a clear plan to restore Hannah. But I want to ask a question today that we all may need to ask at one point in our life. Does God have a plan to restore me? Can God restore me from my disgrace? And it's the beginning of the sermon, but I'm going to give you the answer now. It's yes. The question is how that is more troubling when we feel like we can't get out. Now, my prayer for us is really that God's word would accomplish two things in your life. Number one, I'm praying that, I'm praying that the spirit of God would persuade you to hope again. Because you may feel so lost and at the end of yourselves and you've tried hoping before. And even hearing a message about restoration, you're just already, your shoulders are relaxed, your sigh has been let out, and you're just like, I don't know if I can go through this. I want to persuade you to hope again. Second thing I'm hoping God's Spirit will do in you, that he would give you confidence. Confidence so that you can draw near to the one who can make all things new. So may God give you the hope Again, that he can restore you again. And may he give you confidence that you can draw, he can draw you near. Yes, God can restore. The question is how. And in order to see how we can restore us in our lives, I want to show you how bad things really were in Hannah's life. What really happened to her? Hannah lived in the time of the judges. It was a, it was a really bad time. But for the period, she was married to a reasonably good man, Elkanah. The time of the judges was known by this statement. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
and led the nation into chaos. But Elkanah was a man who obeyed the law. The law required that year by year, uh, men and their families would go up to the temple to offer uh, sacrifices at the annual religious festivals. And year by year, he obeyed the law. He was diligent to obey these rituals, and he brought his family with him. He was a good man, yet marrying two women was a dumb decision. Why would he do this? It's likely that he took a second wife when he realized that his first wasn't able to provide him an offspring. Hannah couldn't have children. And we see in verse 5 that in God's divine plan, the Lord himself chose to close her womb. So, he didn't know this was God's plan, but he decided to be able to get another wife because he wanted to be able to have kids to pass on his inheritance. So, he married Penina. Both of their names have interesting connotations that's helpful to understand kind of the tone of this story. Hannah, Hannah is a name that is similar to the word favor or grace. And for the people of Israel, bearing children was a sign of God's favor to them. Yet rather than enjoying God's grace to no fault of her own, the woman of grace felt disgraced. Ironically, her rival, as the scripture calls her, Penina, her name kind of... uh, Sounds like the Hebrew word of like abundance, which is relevant because that seems to be how many children that she had. Barrenness was just the first of her troubles, though. It got a lot worse than this. Elkanah, he was a good man. He wanted his whole family to be able to worship God rightly. So when they went up to the annual festivals, he gave his uh, Hannah and Penina, or he gave Penina and all her children equal portions so that they could offer sacrifices to the Lord. Penina was given portions so that she could equally distribute to their children so that their whole family could worship. And she had many children, sons and daughters. Yet, Hannah had no children. If, you, if there was going to be some equality in the math here, she would have had just the same amount of portions as all of Penina's children. But, also not a very good decision, Alcana gave Penina, uh, Hannah preferential treatment. She had no children, yet she got a double portion of all the sacrifices. In that, that preferential treatment caused a lot of harm for Hannah. This is the first real depth of the trouble that she experienced. Hannah was mistreated by Penina. Notice the language that the scripture says, verse 5, But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her room. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. That's really severe. This sounds like, like, high school level drama on steroids. And it wasn't like to know, it wasn't abstract. It wasn't, she was very particular about the kind of harassment that she gave to him. You can't have kids. This math of the sacrifice, what I get and what you get doesn't work out and I'm going to make sure that you know it. Year by year, she simply wanted to go and sacrifice. She just wanted to come and worship her Lord, yet she was left disgraced, harassed, depressed, and alone. Now, Alcana, good man, he had a bad response. He sees her, and she's so sorrowful, she won't even eat. Verse 8, Alcana, her husband, said, Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more than you to you than ten sons? Akana's a little dim-witted, which I relate to as a husband sometimes. I give you the larger portions of offerings. I give you the larger portions of my affection. What else can I give to you? He doesn't understand. Mistreated by a rival, misunderstood by her husband, 
But then one year, something different happens. She goes and pours out her soul in prayer to Yahweh of hosts. This term, this uh, title of the Lord is used a few times in this passage. And it's the first time that this name, this title of God is used so far in Scripture from Genesis onwards. And its meaning is really significant. Yahweh is the personal name of God. It's used by those who are part of the covenant nation of Israel, God's treasured possession, who know God and are known personally by God. Those who use this name know that they're objects of God's steadfast love, his abundant mercy, his tender compassion. Yahweh of hosts, though, is a military name. It describes the unmatched authority and might that God has over all nations to deliver his covenant people when they are in trouble. She is disgraced. She is harassed. She is depressed. She is alone. She feels like there's nowhere left to go and nothing left to do, but maybe the God of covenant can show compassion on her. Maybe the God of military might can show his power to her. So she turns to God in prayer and makes a vow. Verse 10, she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. This vow is a unique kind of vow. What's significant about not having, having a beard and not shaving your whole life? It's likely that Hannah here is committing her son to what's called a Nazarite vow. Uh, John the Baptist likely was a man who made a Nazarite vow. Um, Nazarites were people who believed they were called to a unique task to be fulfilled, and they wanted God's favor and God's blessing on it. So they would commit to a unique kind of prohibitions in their life. Like uh, John the Baptist, kind of weird guy, didn't shave, ate locusts and honey, wore leather belts. Samuel, who would be the son who would be born of this, was going to be committed to this kind of vow as well. She was saying, this is so critical and so important to me, but I believe that if you provide this child to me, that his life is going to mean something, and I will offer him back to you and ensure that he uniquely follows your law so that he can do your work. Notice that she was asking for the fulfillment of this prayer, but she also wasn't asking it for selfish gains. Give me a child so that Penina will just stop it. Give me a child so I can parade him around in really cute tunic when I go to the festival and everyone can see how cute my child is. She wanted to see God fulfill what was lacking in her, but she was prepared to give it back to the Lord. And she was at such a vulnerable moment, distressed, weeping, bitterly, not eating. Yet at such a vulnerable moment, her troubles actually even got worse. She was mistreated by a rival, misjudged by her husband, and then, or excuse me, mistreated by a rival, and then she was misunderstood by her husband, and then she was misjudged and shamed by a spiritual leader. Where she was praying, verse 9, it says, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. I don't know very kind words to say about Eli. Eli was about as useless as the chair that he was sitting on at the temple. We learn later on that Eli was an incredibly obese person, and he became obese because he would forcibly take 
the cooked meat from the sacrifices and engorge himself on the offerings that the people of God had made. He was a hypocrite. He had no self-control. He was useless. He was also close to being blind. At his old age, he was a priest, but he was a retired priest. So his sons were the one who administered the, the sacrifices. Retired priests in the law had a different kind of duty. They were kind of more like temple guards, like the hall monitor of the temple, making sure that no one was acting out. Um, also, they were judges. So if someone had like a conflict with someone else, they would come and that he would make um, kind of mediate between the two. So like this hall monitor, temple guard, and this judge who's supposed to mediate and understand right between wrong, and he clearly cannot see what's happening in these circumstances. The man meant to keep a watchful guard over the worshipers of the temple could not see this woman's heart. The man meant to judge the people of Israel misjudged and shamed her pure prayer. Look at verse 12 with me. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. How good of a priest are you if you can't even recognize when someone's praying? How bad of a moral culture it is when you think that people are praying are drunk? Eli said to her, verse 14, How long will you be, go on being drunk? Put your wine away. 15, Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking under my great anxiety and vexation. What he said is worse than you realize. She interprets what she says as him um, judging her as a worthless woman. This is worse than what you realize. This comment is literally translated daughter of Belial. Belial is a false god that people worshipped in ancient times. The same term is used in Deuteronomy 13.13. 13. Idol worship was against God's Ten Commandments. And if you were found in idol worship, it was so severe that it came with capital punishment. And if it had so saturated into a whole town that the whole town had become worshiping idols, the consequences of the law was that another town must come, verify that it was true, and then put the whole town under rubble. And those people who were false worshipers, who were stoned so that the whole nation or the whole city was dot, brought down under rubble and purged, those people were called sons and daughters of Belial. If you wanted a list of the worst, like, top, top 10 bad names of ancient Israel, this one might have been at the top. How would you respond to being treated like that? Mistreated, misunderstood, and now misjudged by the person who's supposed to be your spiritual leader. I've had some bad things said about me in the past. You know what I wish? I wish I was, I like cooking. I wish I was cast iron. I wish I was stainless steel. I have a cast iron flat top for my barbecue and I can cook anything on it. Then I can just toss it into my stainless steel stink and just like put any kind of abrasive to it and it holds up. But more often when I'm mistreated by people, I don't feel like cast iron or stainless steel. I feel like cheap Teflon. Like I nicked it with my butter knife and now the whole thing is useless. How would you respond in a situation like that? Astonishingly, Hannah still speaks respectfully towards him. She uses this like, uh, no, my Lord. She respects his position of authority. But then when Eli realizes he's in the wrong, a shift happens. He changes his mind and honors his prayer rather than shaming it. And then... This changes her heart. Verse 17, Then Eli answered, Go in peace, 
and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. She said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord, and they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. This was the prayer that she prayed. Remember me. And when she received a blessing from the priest, her mood started to change. She was no longer sad. Notice how she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Remember, Hannah means favor or grace. She starts to be able to see herself the way that God sees her again. She hasn't been able to worship. She goes and just mourns, but then she wakes up the next morning and rises and worship. And then she goes home and her husband knows her and the Lord remembers her. One of the first sermons I heard Pastor Ray preach in Markham was Exodus chapter two. Exodus chapter two, verse 24, uses the same word of remember. And it's not just like a thoughtless, oh, I don't want to forget this on my honey-do list. I do that a lot. When we were packing to go up to Ottawa, as we were going out, we thought they had the whole car packed. And about three times in a row, I come back to the car, my wife says, did you remember your sunglasses? I did not remember my sunglasses. Get my sunglasses, come back. Did you remember your water bottle? I did not remember my water bottle. And by the third time, I feel like I'm just as capable as my toddlers that we bring in the car with me. (laughs) When God remembers, it's not because he has thoughtlessly forgotten you. It's because he's intervening at the moment that he is choosing for your good. In Exodus chapter 2, 24, after 400 years of slavery, it says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What was God doing for 400 years? Thoughtlessly forgetting that the people that he chose as his chosen, uh, as treasure possession were in slavery? Like, oh yeah, Abraham, I remember that guy. No, when God remembers, he intervenes according to his promises for your good at the right time that he chooses. Hannah calls out to God and God remembers her. And then verse 20, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked him from the Lord. Samuel means God hears. Christian, this is your hope. Can God restore you from disgrace? Yes. You feel afflicted. You feel disgraced, harassed, depressed, alone. At the end of yourself, there's nothing you left you can do. Just like Hannah, just like his people Israel, God sees. God hears. God remembers. Yet miraculously, when God intervened and remembered here, it wasn't just good for Hannah. See, Samuel would be a son who would be born to a woman, but who would become a prophet to the nation. And Samuel would be the one who would bring uh, restoration to these people. He was the final and last judge. He restored true temple worship to the people. He restored God's law to God's people. And eventually, he anointed David as king. And after a time of chaos, because God remembered a woman, God remembered a nation. There's another unique parallel in this as well. Because centuries later, there was another woman born uh, who was barren in her later years and who desperately wanted a child. And her name was Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, with her husband, cried out to the Lord, and God provided for them John the Baptist. As Samuel prepared the way 
for King David to restore the nation of Israel, John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus, who would be the king of all the earth. This is the remarkable thing about what we see when God intervenes. What he does for an individual isn't just for their own good. God remembered a woman and he remembered a nation. And this showed that God would remember another woman and he would remember all of creation. And here is hope for you, Christian. The God who cares about all creation and who cares for the nations also cares for you. Yes. Can God restore you from disgrace? Yes. Christian, Yahweh of hosts, the compassionate God and the powerful God sees you, hears you, remembers you. He is prepared to intervene for your good according to his promises at the right moment that he chooses. So that begs the question then, like when? And can it be now? Um, my dad was very mechanical growing up. He drove trucks and then he was able to eventually have his own transportation company. Um, I wish it took more advantage to be able to learn from him how to be able to do mechanical stuff when I was younger. But now that I have a son, um, I'm learning more things from my dad. I'm trying to teach my son too. And I decided I was going to bite the bullet and try and change my own oil at this last change. So I did a YouTube tutorial. I went to Canadian Tire and looked like a goof wandering around for 15 minutes until I asked for help. And then me and my five-year-old son tried to change the oil together. I think I did more of the work than him, but I'll give him a little credit too. I didn't realize how much of the used oil would come out. Uh, and my pan wasn't big enough. <laughs> and... Uh, now I realize what all those other black spots on other people's driveways are <laughs> that I can now see on mine. I'll have a bigger pan for next time. But for as long as we have this house and maybe longer than the house exists, we're going to have that black spot from that moment always there to remember when my pan wasn't big enough. Now, as funny as that little story is, much of the circumstances that we are experiencing, like Hannah, when we're troubled by things that are outside of control, like Hannah had a health problem, she couldn't have child, Hannah was mistreated by someone who treated her horribly, Hannah was misunderstood by someone and she felt alone, uh, this can create a huge stains on our souls that cause disgrace to our dignity. And as much as we want it to be washed away, even though we are in Christ, we can look back at to that moment when that happened and still feel ashamed. And we know we're in Christ, but we wonder, can I actually be healed? Can I actually be cleansed? Does God actually see? How can God actually intervene? How could God actually restore me from disgrace? I want to persuade you to have hope. Remember God's character. Those vulnerable moments when, guys, the rage that you have over the wrong, that you keep raging over in anger, that for maybe months or years has never made it right and has only created or tornado that has destroyed relationships around you. God sees every outburst that you've had. Or those wet tears that you have time over time when you realize or say, why do I have to redo my mascara again? The scripture says that God counts every tear and puts them in his bottles. He sees every sleepless night whenever you felt alone because when you've remembered your shame, God has seen it. So then you wonder, well then, why can't God fix it? Well, let's look to see how even God has fixed even greater things to show you that God can even fix this. What is the worst problem that all of us have experienced? The worst pain of all the all of the world, is that we are not broken in the troubles of our circumstances, but that we are broken in our relationship with God. And that we bear the stain of unholiness and sin 
that none of us could ever remove and leave all of us condemned before God's righteous law, deserving the punishment of eternity in hell. And what was needed for God to be able to cleanse this shame from you? The only capable thing to cleanse us from the shame of our sin was the blood of his only begotten son. Now, this is his son, and Christ is divine. Yet God willingly and freely gave his only begotten son. And Romans chapter 8 says, How will he not with him also graciously give us all things? Friend, if God is able to have delivered you from the shame of your sin and restore you to you and look at all of your brokenness and still say, I love you, how can he not also uh, heal us and cleanse us from our present troubles? He can. Now, honestly, though, there are some things that we will, may not be healed in this life. There may be some marks that we carry with us to the end. Yet then, we have the hope, as it says in 2 Corinthians, that the troubles and sufferings of this life are not being worth compared to the glory that we have in the life to come. So I don't know your circumstances. This is the one of the troubles about being a guest speaker. When I can preach this in my church, I can look at people and I see their eyes and I know their troubles. And I don't know yours. So there may be things that you may be taking to your grave that may not be able to be fixed as you want. There may be some things that God can intervene and completely and miraculously restore. Either way, even if you feel that that stain cannot be removed and other people see it and they'll always see it as only that, God see, until that day when God brings you home, God sees something different. Psalm 103 says that God crowns us with steadfast love and honor. You know what that means? When Elizabeth or Charles was first crowned king or queen, they are always king and queen, but they do not always wear the crown. But at uh, ritualistic partis- uh, events, when it's they want to make it obviously clear to everybody that they are above and greater of immense dignity they are given the crown. And the crown is the sign of the dignity that exists in their office. Scripture says that you are crowned with steadfast love. Others might see a a stain of shame, but because you are in Christ at all times, God sees a woman and a man clothed in righteousness. And though you may still have tears now and God is counting them now, there is a day coming where he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and the old will fully and completely pass away and the new will have come. Can God restore you from disgrace? Yes, God sees you. God hears you. God remembers you. I hope that you can know that you can have hope even in your disgrace. But I don't want you just to be able to know that cognitively. I want you to be able to practice it specifically. How can we know this personally when we draw near to him in prayer like Hannah? Soon I'll explain to you how we can draw near to him. But first, to encourage your hope, I want to show you the way that Hannah herself was restored. Have joy in seeing the way that Hannah was restored. God gave her this child, and then all the things that shamed her with disgrace, God slowly made undone. Where once Hannah was misjudged, then she was blessed. The man who said she was a daughter of Belial then turned and realized the purity that she was. She was no longer misjudged, She was blessed. She was no longer misunderstood by her husband. She was affirmed. In verse 21 and onward, when they go on to their next, uh, when Hannah and his family is going to their next sacrifice, Hannah affirms her vow. Now, this is a deliberate and unique act that Elkanah does. In the law, if a wife makes a vow that is rash and foolish because she's under the headship and authority of her husband, according to scripture, 
the husband has an authority to be able to nullify the promise that she's made. Now, Elkanah really loved Hannah, and he really wanted a child from Hannah. And to come home and say, honey, something happened at church today. And he hears like, you asked for a child and you're going to give this child. You've been waiting for this child for how long? And you're just going to give it away? He had the authority to be able to nullify that law, but he didn't. He upheld it. He affirmed her. He saw her and he validated it. Where once she was misjudged, then she was misblessed. When once she was misunderstood, then she was affirmed. Where once she was mistreated, then she was validated. Eventually, she weans the child, which means the child no longer needs to nurse, and he doesn't need, uh, can eat his own food, and he can probably toddle around probably about three years for weaning to happen, and then she brings the child up. Now, every year, year by year, when she went up, she was mistreated, and she was irritated, and she was provoked by her rival. This year, though, the sacrifice that she brings is immense. Verse 24 It says that she brought a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, a skin of wine. Now, when an Israelite fulfilled a vow, they needed to bring a vow offering to give as a sacrifice to the Lord to say, I've done what I've said I would do. Yet what she gives is probably three times what is required by the law for a vow offering. Yet that is incredibly remarkable, but there's something even more remarkable than that, and it's something that you cannot hear. What's remarkable is the silence. Penina has nothing to say anymore. No more harassment. Where once she was misjudged, then she was blessed. Where once she was misunderstood, then she was affirmed. Where once she was mistreated, then she was vindicated. The woman of disgrace has become graced once again. Everything that shamed her, God had undone because God remembered her. She's finally restored. But how was it that she was able to find this restoration, God brought her to the end of herself so that he, she, when there was nowhere left to turn, she turned to him in prayer. And Christian, if you find yourself at the end of yourself, filled with shame and disgrace, this is where God wants to bring you to. Eli was a pretty useless priest. And it In Hannah's most vulnerable moment, he completely dropped the ball. Here's the good news for you, Christian. You have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. So I want you to know that you can, with confidence, draw near to God. Pour out your heart before him. And here's the reason why you can. Because when you draw near to God, the one who stands to mediate between you and the Father is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect was tempted as we are, yet without sin. That means Jesus knows what you're going through, and he's able to help you. So, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God can remember you, but he wants you to draw near. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Does God already know what you need? Yes. But he wants you to depend on him, Christian. And you know the key ingredient that this needs for you to be able to draw near to him. Solitude. One of the rarest commodities that so many of us don't know how to withdraw and spend today. See, God can restore you. God can change so that your anxiety is turned into peace. Your shame is turned into honor. But you need to turn to him. And you need to be able to remove the distractions, silence the voices, get in quiet, and pour out your heart. Do you know how to do that? 
The scripture calls this kind of prayer lamenting. And Christian, if you find yourself that you need to be restored from, the, from disgraced, then I'm urging you today to practice lament. Lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. What does that look like? First, bringing our honest complaint before him. When I speak with people and the troubles that they have and they just pour out their, their affliction towards me, it's a pretty sobering thing. People will often say in pastoral counseling, like I'm telling you things that I've never told anyone else before. It's really humbling to hear. But usually when I have a conversation with them and they lay out the heart before me, I will ask a similar question, anticipating a similar response. The question I will ask them is, have you been as honest with God in prayer as you've been honest with me right now? And I can only recall one instance in the many years that I've been doing this that someone said, yes. More often, it's no. Lament, a prayer in pain that leads to trust in God. It means like all of the emotions that you've been bottling up, the way that you've been looking at this circumstance, you bring before the Lord and say, I can't take it anymore. Why is this happening? Uh, as the psalmist says, I am restless in my complaint and I moan. I've forgotten to eat my bread. From the ends of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. Lament starts with honestly, reverently, and humbling laying your complaint before him. But then it asks specifically, God, I need your help. God, I need your help here. God, I need your help now. God, I need you to intervene because there's nothing that I can do. Here's the hardest part, though, of practicing a lament. It's waiting. Because when God remembers, he intervenes in the time that he chooses. But often what God wants us to do when we are waiting is to build courage within you. The book of James said, we count those blessed who remained steadfast. Psalm 27 says, T uh, wait on the Lord, be of good courage and wait on the Lord. Jesus had to practice this kind of prayer the night before he was crucified. And it didn't change his circumstances, but it changed his heart. God can intervene in the time that he chooses for your good, and he wants you to draw near to him. I wish I were cast iron. I wish I were stainless steel. But like you, there are so many things that mark me and stain me that I can't remove and can't avoid. God is able to restore us from disgrace because of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. You can hope in his character and you can confidently draw near to him because of a great high priest who sympathizes with your weaknesses. Christian, if you find yourself here, I urge you to not let the night pass without drawing near to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful for your son, Jesus Christ, that he cares for us and that he loves us. Father, I'm, no, I'm comforted that your Holy Spirit knows each of us personally. And I pray, Lord God, that we would not hold on to burdens beyond our strength, but that we would lay them down at your feet. Lord, I pray that there would be a greater love for Christ Jesus and a greater honor of your name. I pray that you would relieve uh, this, these people, Lord God, of the disgrace that they feel. And I pray that they would find a great assurance knowing that they're justified by grace through faith. We thank you that you see us, that you hear us, and that you can remember us. In Jesus' name, amen.